Ada. Professor? Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a huge uh, pleasure and honor to join this uh, uh, webinar. I want to thank the Ken invitation to the Philippine uh, Society of Gynecological Endoscopy. Uh, I am uh, from Porto, from Portugal, uh, and uh, I will share with you some uh, uh, experience, some knowledge, some tips and tricks about uh, a topic of paramount importance that is the total laparoscopic hysterectomy. We know that after C-section, the hysterectomy is the most commonly uh, surgical procedure uh, performed in gynecology. So it's very important and I, want, I will focus in the details and uh, sharing several videos and at the end, please do not hesitate to make uh, questions. So during these pandemic times, we have changed the focus of uh, our uh, efforts on how we adapt to live uh, or our life with this COVID in the new normal of surgical practice, education and uh, research. Uh, the surgical training has been deeply affected in different ways. New avenues of academic training will need to be explored. Platforms of remote academic training are being developed and potentiated, including teleconference, webinars, and other online educational material uh, like we are doing now. As you can see in this uh, interesting paper uh, published uh, in the Annals of Surgery. We have to be prepared for these times and uh, use these uh, new tools to communicate and share uh, the knowledge. Portugal, you see, is the most Western country in Europe. There is a, a long way between us. Fernand Magalhães in the 16th century, he took months uh, to, to all this way around uh, uh, African coast and uh, arrive in uh, in Philippines. Nowadays, if we want to be as quick as possible, the shortest time to fly from Porto to Manila, it takes around 21 hours. Uh, uh, if you take uh, average uh, connection, you can uh, spend more than one day. But at this moment, using these new technologies, we are spending few seconds, even less than seconds, to uh, communicate and uh, share the knowledge. Well, after this introduction, I'm going to focus in the total laparoscopic hysterectomy uh, in a systematic approach, uh, trying to uh, present every step of the procedure and analyze each detail of each step. And at the end, I will also uh, share some uh, cases that are more complex that uh, surely we will face in our uh, clinical practice and we have to adapt our uh, technique. Very old picture uh, of the probably one of the first uh, uh, hysterectomies uh, that time they started by vaginal approach. This is one old video with several years showing Kurt Sam trying to perform a, a the minimal invasive approach to hysterectomy. Look at the quality of this picture. Uh, not simple to see the anatomical details. In fact, it was uh, uh, suturing by uh, laparoscopy. You see the uterine manipulator. He performed the subtotal hysterectomy. Now he was uh, suturing the vascular pedicle. Anyway, there was some evolution in the image quality. And here in 1999, you can see this uh, video of Harry Rich. In fact, uh, he did a remarkable job. He described and published the first uh, total laparoscopic hysterectomy. And here you can see that with a better vision, you can distinguish in a better way the different anatomical structures and uh, when you are, for example, closing the vaginal cuff, you can identify the ultrasacral ligaments, the different fascia, anterior and posterior fascia, that uh, was not simple to identify with the 
initial uh, vision systems like you have seen before with Kurt Sam. Well, to succeed in total laparoscopic hysterectomy, we have to respect uh, some uh, uh, conditions. We, we have to follow the ergonomy and that I will present just afterwards. We have to have a, a set of uh, instruments that should be the correct ones. And of course, you have to know the technique. The ergonomy, this uh, uh, strange word, means uh, the, the, the study of the, the, the things that are related to the efficiency and comfort in the working environment. This is uh, the picture of Harry Rich in the first uh, uh, laparoscopic hysterectomies, and you see the head and the body of him was not in the correct position. If he stays like uh, this uh, for a long time, surely he will have problems in the neck uh, and in his back, what is not correct. This is another example. This is a picture of one of our training courses in Portugal. You see this uh, trainee is uh, training uh, with the arms too high and then he is not in an ergonomic position like I'm uh, showing to you how it should be. There are several studies uh, establishing the relationship between ergonomy and the laparoscopy and uh, this uh, uh, paper from the pediatric surgery uh, focus in something that is very important. For example, the relationship between the, the arms and the trunk, you should have a 90 degree angle in order that you are comfortable, you can be more efficient during your procedure. Also the way that you look at the screen is very important. Your height should be at the same level of your screen in order that you don't need to put your neck or your head in a bad position. You see here the 90 degree angle and here you see that your screen should be just in front of you. These are simple things, but make the difference mainly if it is a long procedure. If it is a long procedure, for example, here, the way that you take the, the camera uh, on your hand, uh, it's uh, important to have a good vision, to keep comfortable. Uh, when the assistant is showing the surgeon the surgical file, then that is the correct way. Also, the position that you put uh, the patient on the surgical bed, uh, for example, the relationship between the, the bed and the, the, the legs should be around 15 degrees. Just a few details that we should take into account before we start the procedure. This is the instrument set. As I said, we cannot make omelets without the, the proper heads, without heads. Uh, this is the basic. We need a, a grasper, we need a scope. Uh, we need uh, trocars, you know, trocars, they make the interface between the exterior and interior uh, um, of the abdominal cavity. You need the scissors, you need the needle holders. Uh, at least you will need to close the vaginal cuff. So you have to be prepared to suture by laparoscopy. If you are not skilled to suture by laparoscopy, don't go for TLH. Uh, you should train before uh, how to suture correctly, and then you go for TLH, and you need a good bipolar instrument. And nowadays, as you will see during uh, my presentation, we have very nice tools, very uh, precise bipolar instruments that gives you the ability to uh, dissect, to uh, make the hemostasis in an efficient and uh, safe way. For total laparoscopic hysterectomy, that is uh, an instrument that uh, is crucial. Some uh, authors say that it may makes 50% of the TLH if it is well used, if it is used in the correct way. I speak about this uh, uterine manipulator, very important. Uh, he has uh, several uh, tasks, uh, but basically he offers a good uh, uh, exposition to the to the surgeon uh, in the anterior compartment to see, for example, here the vaginal cuff in the posterior 
uh, compartment, you can see the utrosacral ligament. It exposes you all the anatomical structures, the ligaments that you should approach when you go for TLH. In uh, the European Society of Gynecological Endoscopy, we have published the, the key steps uh, the surgical steps of the total laparoscopic hysterectomy that you can take a look on it. Uh, it's uh, uh, available in uh, our journal, Facts, Views and Vision. But then I'm going, as I said, to describe each step of the TLH in order you uh, realize at the end that it's not so complicated. If you do correctly each step, you can make it in a good way. This is the coagulation and section of the, the round ligament. And here I will put in the beginning, it's very important the work of the uterine manipulator. You see the uterine manipulator is pushing the uterus uh, to the right side of the patient, uh, putting the round ligament under tension. Uh, and then you see that uh, here there is this uh, gray area uh, and uh, above this gray area, it's where you should coagulate and cut uh, your uh, round ligament, because if you go medial to this gray area, you may find some vessels, some veins uh, that uh, can cause uh, some bleeding. And of course, if you go uh, lateral to this area, you can find the external uh, iliac vessels that you don't want to, to reach. So you see under tension, you go with your bipolar. As I said, nowadays we have good bipolars and you see immediately the tissue becomes white. Why does it becomes white? It becomes white because of the protein denaturation. There is a electrosurgery that goes between the jaws of this bipolar instrument and this electrosurgery uh, causes the desiccation of the tissue, I mean, it removes the water from the tissue that is between the jaws. And at the same time, it causes protein denaturation that uh, puts the tissue white. Is the same um, pro, uh, that happens when you uh, eat an uh, egg. The albumin of the egg becomes white because of the albumin denaturation, the protein denaturation. You can see also a few bubbles uh, coming out, you see the bubbles, the bubbles is the water that is coming out uh, of the cells. And even if you don't have a good electrosurgical unit that measures the resistance between the jaws, measures the impedance, and when the impedance or resistance is maximum, it means that there is no uh, electricity passing between the two jaws. Uh, when uh, you have these machines, they measure and normally they stop or they make a beep that tells you that the resistance is maximum and then that you can stop. But even if you don't have these sophisticated machines, just looking to, using your eyes, using your brain, you see these bubbles coming out. When the bubbles stop, it means that there is no more water between the jaws. It means that you can go uh, and cut in a safe way because it means that uh, there is no uh, blood uh, in between and you should cut exactly in the same place where you coagulate above the gray area as I said normally that is the Samson artery that is in the base of the round ligament that goes around that and you should coagulate it precisely and cut in an uh, efficient and safe way. This is simply the first step. I think uh, the first step uh, uh, reaches this area. This is the broad ligament. And here we already can identify the anterior leaflet of broad ligament and the posterior leaflet of the broad ligament. And then we go for the, but you see this small bleeding was uh, uh, coming from the Samson uh, artery. But you should go again with the bipolar. Uh, I have a video with a different device, but anyway, the principle is the same. Um, we are using a ceiling device, but uh, uh, you do exactly the same population and cut. Uh, I think you have understood. The, the difference is that with this device, you cause some ceiling on the tissue and there are advantages uh, of it, but also uh, to open the leaflets uh, 
can be a, a little bit um, a tricky. Anyway, just to show you this alternative. The second step is the uh, uh, opening of the anterior leaflet of the broad ligament. Remember, we coagulated and cut the round. Uh, then we have these two leaflets, the anterior and the posterior leaflet of broad ligament. And then you wait a little bit that the gas infiltrates between the two leaflets and then you will have this approach. Again, you see the job of the uterine manipulator. The uterine manipulator now is pushing uh, to the right, but also pushing uh, cephalate or cranially. Uh, in order we have this tissue under tension uh, to make uh, uh, surgery, to cut. It's important that we always have our tissues uh, under tension. Uh, if we want to use electrosurgery here, we should put this like a tent. Uh, you see, we are using this instrument that goes through the, uh, the tent, putting the tissue uh, like this, and then you go with your scissors uh, using monopolar current, uh, cut mode, and uh, uh, very important, uh, the assistant can grasp the round ligament, helping to put the, the leaflet under tension, and then you go like this, uh, 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 using the monopolar scissors, uh, using cut mode, I mean pushing the yellow pedal if you have it uh, uh, configured in the right way, and then you go like this. You see, uh, you should push the pedal before you touch the tissue because you want to cause a vaporization effect on the tissue. You want to cause the cut surgical effect and then you have uh, electrical heart that should be very small. Uh, so uh, if you respect these electrosurgical roles, you can cut this tissue like you are seeing here, uh, like a cold knife, and you go up to the vesico-uterine or vesico-vaginal fold. You can dissect a little bit more in order that you expose, you can expose all the vessels around uh, the veins, remember, and sometimes you can see even the uterine artery in, uh, in this step that uh, is beating. You should go up to the vesico uh, uterine fold. Okay, I think you understand. This is another example with another device. As the principle is exactly the same. You see the CO2 going through the, the space, the assistant grasping the ground, opening the anterior leaflet, going down, uh, and uh, you can dissect, uh, helping a little bit with this uh, uh, beautiful uh, dissector and bipolar, and then you make the tent and you go in the same way up to the vesico uterine uh, space. The third step is the fenestration of the broad ligament. There is some controversy about this step. Uh, some surgeons say that it can be a wasting of time, but in fact, it is not. And you will see, uh, you will feel it because it gives us uh, several anatomical and surgical landmarks that are very important. You see what we do, we fenestrate, we make a window in the posterior leaflet. Of, of course, we have to pay attention to some uh, veins and vessels that can be around. Um, uh, you need to dissect sometimes. Uh, and then you have the window. And this window, there are some uh, uh, roles that we should uh, respect. We go with the two instruments and we should open the window uh, parallel to the IP ligament or parallel to the uterus, horizontally or vertically. If you want to leave the ovaries, it's better to make the fenestration parallel to the uterus. If you want to remove the ovaries together with the uterus, it's better that uh, you open uh, the window uh, parallel to the IP ligament in a transversal uh, way. So after making this fenestration, you know that uh, the, we will enlarge this fenestration. We know that the vessels are medial to the fenestration and we know that the ureter is lateral to this fenestration. We enlarge carefully. This is not a, 
a simple uh, case, but anyway, even in uh, uh, more vascular cases, we have to follow the rules. This is a, a, a case that you can see in a, in a better way, the posterior leaflet, but again, you enlarge your, your penetration. Here, uh, the, the, the hemostasis should be very careful, and then you are sure that the ureter is lateral and the vessels are, are medial. Uh, it gives you uh, safety in your approach to the uh, uterine vascular uh, pedicle. But I will show you afterwards the advantages. This is another example, the fenestration. Pay attention when we do it. Sometimes you have the bowel just behind. And also I want to show you that the ureter goes in the posterior leaflet of broad ligament. Uh, always remember that and the, the ureter is very close to the uterine artery in, uh, in that area. But we will go into detail about it afterwards. This is the, the fourth step, the coagulation and section of the fundibular pelvic ligament. Uh, if you want to remove the ovaries together with the uterus or the uterovarian ligament, if you want to leave the ovaries back. This is a, a old video. In this time, we uh, did not perform the opportunistic or prophylactic uh, salpingectomy, um, but nowadays we do it. Uh, I will show you some videos of it. Uh, but here uh, is uh, uh, what I wanted to show you. If you have the fenestration, if you have the window, you can go with your instrument and you can delimitate exactly the tissue that you have to coagulate and cut. This is the utero of iron ligament. Uh, you have all this tissue and with the fenestration, you know that uh, uh, you can coagulate everything here. Don't, no worries about the ureter, no worries about other uh, structures that you can damage. So uh, it's relevant and uh, from my point of view is one of the good uh, benefits of uh, making the fenestration. And then you go with your bipolar. Remember what I said, look at the screen, see the bubbles, see the water. This is the coagulation of the uterovarian ligament. Uh, you should cut exactly in the same place that you have uh, coagulated and then uh, uh, precise hemostasis. Sometimes you need to go with your instrument and compress the tissue to avoid uh, any bleeding. And then you go small cuts slowly and you cut the ultraovarian uh, ligament um, in this uh, uh, simple way. And no worries about the ureter because we know that it is a way. This is what we do nowadays, the opportunistic uh, salpingectomy. Uh, 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 we leave the ovaries, but we remove the uterus plus the, the tubes. And here we use the different techniques and we go very close to the tube in order we preserve the uh, vessels uh, and the irrigation that go to the ovary because one of the problems related with this uh, opportunistic salpingectomy was the risk of impairing the ovarian irrigation. So if we go very close to the tube, we decrease this, uh, that risk. I mean, we should preserve as much as possible the mesosalpings uh, to keep the ovarian uh, irrigation, uh, uh, to keep the ovarian function. Another example, opportunistic salpingectomy. You can use other devices, but uh, as you have seen with a reusable uh, bipolar, you can do the job in a, a very efficient uh, and, uh, and good way. Uh, this is uh, uh, just to show you that we can also use a different approach, but the principle, the surgical uh, procedure, it's exactly the same. Uh, when we want to remove the ovaries together with the uterus, we have to coagulate and cut the IP ligament. And then it's very important that your assistant grasps uh, the, the tube or the ovary, but the tube works very well to put the IP under tension. And if you do like this, you uh, control the distance between the IP and the ureter. Remember that the ureter goes just medial to the IP. And then if you apply some tension like we are doing now, you, we separate the IP from the ureter and from this uh, area where goes the external iliac vessels like the external iliac artery and the external iliac uh, vein. 
we can use a ceiling device, but also you can use a bipolar that works very, very well. And it's a reusable instrument. The fifth step is the opening of the posterior leaflet of broad ligament up to the cervix. And this step uh, is uh, uh, relevant because of uh, two uh, main things. If you free this posterior leaflet, you gain more mobility when you are mobilizing your uterus with the uterine manipulator. You can push your uterus more cephalate, more cranially, and then if you can do it, you increase the distance between the uterine uh, vessels and the, and the ureter. Uh, and also you can expose better the uterine vascular pedicle. So uh, when you will go for a uterine vessels coagulation, if you uh, have a better exposition of the vessels, you can be more precise and more efficient in your uh, vessels uh, coagulation. Uh, another example, uh, don't uh, regret to spend some time on this step uh, because you gain safety. And the, if you can uh, isolate better the uterine artery, you can be more precise in your coagulation approach and then you uh, reduce the risk of uh, complications. Before you go to the coagulation of the uterine vessels, it's advisable to uh, open the vesicovaginal space to push the, 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 the bladder down uh, because if you push the bladder down, you also increase the distance between the ureters and the uterine uh, uh, vessels. And for this, um, uh, I want to stress on this picture on the left, it's uh, uh, necessary that your assistant grasps the bladder, not only the pretonium, it's important that the bladder comes uh, anteriorly, and then if the bladder is uh, uh, pulled uh, anteriorly, you see the surgeon uh, shows uh, the, the bladder to the assistant, the bladder is there, the assistant grasps uh, all the tissue, not only the pretonium, and then you can find your plane, you follow the bubbles, and also it's relevant here, the work uh, of the second assistant with the uterine manipulator, because here you have the, the, the cuff of the, the uterine manipulator that is showing you where is the vagina, and then you see these bubbles, you see this uh, space, you just need to uh, follow the bubbles uh, make your dissection, and uh, it's uh, important to distinguish. This is vaginal tissue. Uh, this is the the bladder tissue. The bladder tissue uh, uh, has some uh, fat attached, and remember that the fat belongs to the bladder. It's the same in, uh, as in the posterior compartment. In the posterior compartment, the fat belongs to the bowel. In the anterior compartment, the fat belongs to the bladder, and then you can uh, pull down uh, the, or push down the, the bladder uh, and the uterus also go a little bit uh, down and gains, uh, you gain some safety when you go for uterine uh, artery coagulation. Another approach, but the, the thing is the same uh, using different device. Here you can go centrally. There are some situations that you cannot go uh, uh, this way if there are previous C-sections or if there is uh, endometriosis in the vesico uterine space, it's better to approach laterally uh, and try to identify the limits of your bladder laterally and anteriorly, and then you uh, gain uh, some safety in your dissection of the vesico uterine or vesico uh, vaginal space. Uh, but anyway, the uh, principle is the same that I want to show you. Yeah, this is a nice video, this is a nice case uh, where you can see very uh, easily the, the limits of the, the bladder. You see this is the bladder, this is the vagina, you can see uh, the boundary there, but uh, unfortunately this is not so common. So like this, you know that you have to open there you uh, coagulate the arteria, you go uh, dissecting the tissue gently using the dissector. Uh, uh, remember what I said, it is a strong dissector um, and the tips uh, are not sharp. So you are uh, safe in your dissection approach uh, going in this area uh, 
oh, uh, remember the tissue of the vagina in comparison with the tissue of the of the bladder, different tissues. Uh, if you uh, become familiar with the, these tissues, you uh, increase the, the safety of your uh, approach. The seventh step, as I said, is the coagulation and section of the uterine pedicles. Um, I think this is probably one of the most uh, dangerous uh, uh, steps. I mean, the, probably one that we have to pay more attention because if, you have a, if we have a bleeding there, it can be difficult to control. And then the ureter is uh, close by. And if you try to coagulate uh, everywhere without having a good vision, uh, you can cause a thermal injury in uh, the ureter. Um, that's why before I said that uh, uh, it's important that uh, you have a, a good uh, exposition of the uterine artery. Um, and many times you see it beating and you should go with your bipolar trying to skeletonize uh, the uterine artery and sometimes the uterine veins that are just behind and you can grasp uh, all the, the vascular pedicle but be patient. Sometimes you need to coagulate in different places, uh, one millimeter, two millimeter above, or two or three millimeter uh, uh, below. Uh, uh, remember the principles of the bubbles. Wait that the bubbles stop. It means that there is no uh, water between the jaws of your bipolar. And then small cuts, small cuts. You see there is the uterine there. And uh, now you see the uterine artery, there are the uterine veins just behind, and you should continue carefully, be patient in this step, because if you have a bleeding, um, sometimes also what happens is that the, the uterine artery tip retracts, and it goes into the parametrio, into the cardinal ligament, and then can be very difficult to coagulate it, and uh, uh, the ureter is there and uh, easily you can make a, a burn in your ureter and you can have a fistula uh, afterwards. Another approach, the principle is the same. Uh, you see here uh, we can cut uh, the posterior leaflet of broadly and to have a better exposition of the uterine artery that is just there. And then you go with your instrument, your bipolar, and uh, uh, take it uh, in a, a precise way. Eighth step is the vagina opening. Um, is uh, uh, something uh, simple if you know the principles of uh, electrosurgery, how to use a monopolar current, cut mode, coagulation mode. The, the, the work of the uterine manipulator is also uh, very relevant because it exposes you the vaginal cuff and tells you where you should open the vagina. Uh, I said that you should know about electrosurgery in order to avoid a lot of smoke. Uh, I recommend you to use cut mode uh, and try to apply the monopolar current in a, a small surface. Don't take a, a big surface. Uh, it's better that you make a, a small cut with a, a, uh, your uh, monoplar hook then take a, a, a lot of tissue because you cause uh, a lot of smoke. Uh, your assistant can be with a section device and with the small movements uh, can uh, uh, aspirate a little bit the smoke. If you don't have a good vision in this step, don't uh, uh, continue. Uh, uh, it's better to wait some time. It's better to uh, clean your vision. Uh, to sh we check around if there is any bowel loop, if there is any important structure, uh, because as I said, uh, uh, in this step, there is a lot of uh, uh, steam, a lot of uh, surgical smoke that can impair your vision, but with practice and with training, you uh, know how to decrease it and uh, how to open the vagina in a, a correct uh, way. Um, the ninth step is the uterus removal and can be challenging in uh, some situations, mainly if uh, the uterus is big uh, or uh, no vaginal deliveries before uh, and then can be uh, 
time consuming to to remove your uterus and sometimes you need to cut the uterus in a smaller pieces and uh, you can do it intra-abdominally or you can do it uh, vaginally. We are doing more and more vaginal mutilation uh, for big uterus. Uh, many times we also put them inside the bag. We uh, pull them through the vagina and we mutilate inside uh, the bag. And uh, um, uh, you can do also intra-abdominally using the, the, um, the Chardonnay uh, mucilator uh, that uh, you probably uh, have seen uh, before. The vaginal closure, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, the last step and uh, you have to do it in, the, in a correct way uh, because if you don't do it in the correct way, uh, there are uh, the two risks mainly. There is the risk of vaginal cuff dations uh, and there is also the risk of vaginal uh, cuff uh, uh, prolapse after the procedure. So it's very important that you know how to make the suture by laparoscopy. You can uh, use an extracorporeal approach like in this case, or you can do an intracorporeal approach. It's very important that you join the mucosa, that you join both fascia. You have the anterior vesico uh, vesico-vaginal fascia and you have the posterior rectovaginal or denon biliae fascia and you should uh, join them to restore the endopelvic fascia uh, and uh, in many cases it's recommended also to join both utrosacral ligaments to do what uh, is called the uh, hymacol uh, or modified hymacol approach to decrease the risk of vaginal cuff prolapse after uh, the procedure it's uh, of course necessary to have uh, good needle holders uh, and uh, uh, these ones are probably uh, the best uh, available. You can do, as I said, uh, intracorporeal. Uh, for intracorporeal, you need a shorter uh, thread. 15, 20 centimeter thread is, uh, is enough. Uh, uh, you should join uh, the anterior and posterior uh, mucosa. Uh, take uh, the, the, the fascia, you see, this is the anterior vesico pubo uh, vaginal fascia. Uh, you can take now the left utrosacral ligament, then you will take the right utrosacral ligament, and in the same stitch, you see, the right utrosacral, in the same stitch, you can uh, connect all these structures, trying to restore the pericervical ring and keep the 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 location and the the, the support the, uh, just to show you this detail uh, this is the 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 final aspect of your ovaries you see uh, uh, the the fenestration and the window that we do uh, remember if we want to leave the ovaries uh, we should make the fenestration parallel to the uterus and if we do like this uh, the ovary stays in the correct uh, position after the hysterectomy. If you make the fenestration parallel to the IP ligament, there is the higher risk of having ovarian torsion or a, a longer pedicle in that area, and you also increase the risk of having cysts. So this is the final aspect that I want to uh, underline uh, to show you the importance of making the fenestration uh, in the, in the total laparoscopic hysterectomy. For closure, there is also this barbed sutures that can uh, help a little bit, but anyway, you have to be very careful trying to avoid any barbs uh, uh, um, out of the incision uh, closure because if the bars are exposed, some bowel loops can be attached according to some case reports published then you have to be careful. But anyway, it's a different approach. Uh, can uh, be uh, 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 can be nice because it can save time to the surgeon. But anyway, we have to uh, know how to suture by laparoscopy. If we don't close the vagina in the correct way, we can have situations like this, vaginal cuff stations. Uh, and uh, many times you can have bowel loops that go uh, through this way and can be a uh, urgent or emergent uh, uh, situation. Uh, that's why you should invest time to make the vaginal closure 
I know that the end of the procedure, sometimes the surgical team can be a bit tired, but uh, don't uh, relax uh, in this moment. The closure of the vagina is uh, of paramount importance uh, to avoid this situation that can be really uh, bad for the, those women. Um, finally, uh, I will share with you some more difficult scenarios that, uh, for example, in our center, we are treating more and more as a referral center um, associated with uh, a large uterus with uh, fibroids that change the anatomy. It can be in broad ligament or cervical myomas. These ones can be difficult, uh, but anyway, there are tips and tricks to, to, to make it in the correct way. Um, then you also uh, have the, the possibility to, um, I will just here, uh, wait one second. I will just here make here one thing because uh, I think the, okay. Okay. Um, if you have a severe adhesions uh, associated with uh, endometriosis uh, or uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, also we have to keep in mind that sometimes if you have a big uterus, you have a reduced space, you have less uh, mobility, uh, the anatomy can be changed by the endometriosis, by uh, inflammatory disease, the, the bleeding risk also is increased. Uh, and uh, the tissue extraction sometimes can be challenging, like in this uh, situation, very big uterus. Uh, 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 we have to morselate it using the Shannon knife, uh, and uh, we are cutting the uterus in small uh, pieces. Uh, of course, nowadays, we have to be sure that uh, uh, it is a benign uh, pathology but to show you that uh, we have alternatives uh, in this uh, uh, challenging uh, situations. For the mobility, and th this is why I presented to you this uterine manipulator. There are several in the market. Uh, uh, for example, I remember the Mangeshi card and the Kekstein uh, uterine manipulators are very good. Uh, they work very well. Uh, I like both of them. But we are used more with this one because they, even with the big uterus, it is quite strong to mobilize the uterus to make the antiversion, the lateral and stabilization, and even the elevation of the uterus. It is very strong. Of course, it looks probably too strong, but uh, we should have a tool, we should have a uterine manipulator that works for uh, every scenario from the simple one to the most difficult ones. And then uh, it works quite well. Um, we have sometimes the reduced space, and for that we have to play a little bit with the, the trocar's location. Uh, we know that laparoscopy uh, uh, is a kind of virtual surgery. We see what the scope shows to us. So if we move our scope a little bit upwards above the umbilicus, the, the picture uh, becomes better and we have a better vision of the, uh, our surgical field. Sometimes we can also change our scope for uh, from a zero degree to a 30 degree scope. Uh, it can be helpful to see the lateral uh, parts and lateral compartments. And sometimes we can use some medicines to reduce the, the size of uh, uh, the uterus before the, the surgery. Uh, two important structures in the pelvic side wall that I want to stress uh, is the ureter. Remember that we uh, gynecologists are the biggest predators of the, the ureters. So we have to always keep this in mind and try to avoid to injure the, the ureter. And uh, in many countries, uh, the, the litigancy issues and medical legal issues related to the ureter are very difficult uh, for the doctors, for the surgeons, so we have to pay attention on it. And the best way is to uh, always identify where is the ureter, uh, because if we know where is the ureter pathway, of course, we will try to avoid uh, to cause any injury. And this is the uterine artery that crosses above the, the ureter. Remember the bridge and the water under the bridge. 
and you see here is the uterine uh, uh, area where we make the coagulation is the distance normally is between uh, 15 millimeters up to 20 millimeters so it's very close so if you have a bleeding there if you cannot control your uterine artery when you coagulate uh, many times the uterine artery retracts a little bit and becomes very close to the ureter that's why you have to be very careful when you make the uterine uh, coagulation. Sometimes you have this uh, shape of the uterus, the, remember the cervical fibroids. Uh, and in these cases, um, for example, we, we go to the origin of the uterine artery and we put a clipping there. Uh, and then when we approach uh, to the isthmus, we reduce the risk of, uh, uh, of bleeding. Uh, paying attention to the ureters always of course and paramecium sometimes uh, for hysterectomy we find these uh, scenarios and again we should we have to be patient making the adhesiolysis the bowel and the mental adhesiolysis uh, up to we have a, a good vision of the uterus that we are looking for uh, this is a, a, a uterus with a, a myoma and you see at the end, you have the, the uterus free to go for your uh, procedure. And sometimes if there are big myomas, it's helpful to remove the myomas first and then uh, remove the, uh, the uterus. Because if you remove the myomas first, you get a better exposition. This is a, a, another case uh, full of adhesions, a uh, patient uh, with uh, 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 collect, previous colectomy due to uh, colon cancer. Uh, again, follow the bubbles, be gentle slowly. Sometimes you have to change your uh, trocar's placement, you have to approach from the right. Anyway, just a few examples, but this is what I was telling before. If you have a difficult access to the isthmus, for example, if you have cervical fibroids, or if you have uh, the shape of the uterus with an enlarged isthmus, it's uh, recommended to uh, coagulate the uterine artery at the origin and you can have this approach or you can have the anterior approach. Uh, we are very familiar with this approach, uh, trying to identify the uterine artery at the origin, paying attention to the ureter and uh, following the uh, umbilical uh, artery. This is another uh, example uh, of uh, a broad ligament fibroid of course, it is blocking our access to the uterine artery, uh, but in this case, uh, we recommend to remove first the, the fibroid, uh, paying attention to the vessels, the big vessels that go there, the iliac external vessels, uh, paying attention to the ureter, and on the other side, in the medial side, paying attention to the, to the uterine artery, you see? Uh, it happens uh, and we have to be prepared for this uh, situation using a strong uh, dissector, a precise bipolar instrument uh, when you are approaching this. Be careful, again, don't forget the, the ureter that is uh, very close. After C-section can be also uh, challenging and demanding. This is uh, an example after two C-sections sometimes uh, not simple to identify the bladder uh, limits. Uh, you can use uh, different uh, techniques. You can fill your bladder with saline. You can fill your bladder with CO2. You can um, fill with the methylene blue. But anyway, you, you have to try at the beginning, separate the, the uterus from the abdominal wall in this case, uh, keeping in mind that the anatomy is completely distorted. This is the, the right round ligament uh, that you should try to restore the anatomy before you go for a hysterectomy uh, because uh, you know the anatomical landmarks related to the round ligament. Anteriorly, you have the bladder, Posteriorly, uh, you have the, the, the tubes and the broad ligament, and uh, laterally, you have the external iliac uh, vessels. And in some situations, when you have this uh, um, uh, anterior compartment blocked, can be uh, helpful to secure the blood supply, as I said, to uh, uh, clip the uterine arteries, and then you complete the rest of the hysterectomy and then you approach laterally uh, and anteriorly, as uh, I said uh, before. 
this is another example showing you uh, uh, where is the ureter, paying attention. Uh, you see, if you have a good light, if you don't have any bleeding, uh, the, the, the shape uh, and the picture of the ureter is very uh, typical. This is another situation of uh, uh, endometriosis infiltrating the, um, the cardinal uh, ligament on the left side and the left parametrium. We do the same as we do for radical hysterectomy. Uh, we try to uh, remove the parametrium infiltrated by the disease, keeping attention to the ureter. We go through the ureteric tunnel, uh, trying to respect the ureteric adventitia, and then we go up to the uh, vesico uterine space, to the abuki space, trying also to preserve uh, all the uh, irrigation and innervation of the bladder. I put this example because it happens mainly in endometriosis cases that uh, uh, there is an um, indication for uh, hysterectomy plus um, ophorectomy. And uh, you see many times the, at the beginning you don't uh, find the, the, um, the ureter, uh, the ureter, the ovary, and you see if you are careful in your dissection, look at the beginning, you don't see anything, just a, a, a mass uh, of inflammation of endometriosis, but then you go slowly, uh, blunt dissection uh, using your uh, bipolar, trying to apply some uh, uh, coagulation, apply some traction, and then you can uh, identify the ovary, um, and inside this ovary, there was also uh, endometrioma that uh, I will show to you. This is uh, important because it's very common in endometriosis surgery, the ovarian remnant uh, syndrome, because uh, sometimes we don't remove completely the, the ovary and they continue to uh, produce estrogens. You see the endometriosis, the endometrioma that was inside uh, and at the beginning was not easy to identify. And to finish this uh, last uh, video about uh, uh, some situation that we can find uh, there is indication for hysterectomy and we go with the scope and we don't see any uterus. We just see uh, a mess of uh, bowel loops the, finally, uh, the second assist was uh, moving the uterine manipulator, and we can see the, the uterus finally, but uh, full of adhesions, completely frozen pelvis. But as I said, we have to be careful, we have to be gentle, trying to identify the anatomical uh, structures, uh, the anatomical and surgical landmarks to survive in this uh, challenging and demanding scenario. This is uh, what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Please do not hesitate if you have any question. Thank you very much. Should, uh, also follow the modified IMA call technique in trying to join the, the utrosacral ligaments. Uh, the type of suture, I think, um, is one that we we feel more comfortable. There are some uh, papers and studies that the extracorporeal can be a good choice because we control better the tension that we apply on the, on the tissue and the, on the suture. Uh, but uh, intracorporeally, you also can do it in a correct way. There is also a controversy concerning the type of thread that we should use if we should use polyfilament or monofilament. Uh, the monofilament uh, uh, can be better because it uh, slides better through the tissues. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the barn suture also is an option. We are not still very familiar with it in our, in our center. Uh, but uh, uh, as I said, uh, to use the barn suture, we have to avoid to leave any bar uh, exposed uh, in order to avoid any bowel loop to be attached on it. But uh, if you use it in the correct way, I think it's a good approach and you save time. Uh, but anyway, uh, in uh, our uh, training center, in our hospital, 
we try to uh, uh, go for the intracorporeal uh, because uh, it's a way that the the, the surgeons train the intracorporeal suture uh, to close the vaginal cuff and uh, to join the uterosacros, to join all the structures, to restore the pericervical ring. It uh, has worked well, we have good outcomes and we are happy with it. But I don't know if in the future, now we are using the barred suture, we will change our mind. But uh, the most important is to have a good uh, anatomical uh, outcome. Thank you very much, Professor. Annabelle? Partner. Annabelle? Sir? Yes, sir. Yeah, may I ask an important uh, trick from Professor Ferreira? Yes, sir, of course. Yes, Professor. Uh, we, both, we both agree that uh, clopotomizer and uterine elevator is a very important device in laparoscopic hysterectomy. How, how do you perform hysterectomy in a patient who has a very narrow vagina wherein the device cannot be inserted or maybe in a virgin? Yeah, that's how, exactly. how do you, yeah, how do you um, give a, a landmark uh, for that? That is a good question. Uh, we have cases that uh, is not uh, possible to introduce the uterine manipulator uh, we speak about version, uh, we speak about uh, uh, very old ladies for endometrial cancer with uh, vaginal stenosis uh, uh, and also we operate some uh, uh, malformations, Mullerian malformations uh, and we have to adapt. What we do, we, we use the, the screw, we use the we use the myoma screw uh, to mobilize the uterus uh, 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 as we do with the uterine manipulator. Uh, and sometimes if there is a, a room uh, to make a, a, a bresky valve in the vagina, we, we use it to identify the, the vaginal cuff. But of course, it's a complex procedure. I think uh, it should be performed uh, after uh, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some experience. Uh, but uh, the principles are the same, but we do the, the, we use the screw. The screw works quite well. Uh, uh, we need uh, many times an extra port uh, for the screw. Uh, uh, and uh, it's possible to expose the anterior compartment, the posterior compartment. And sometimes we have to change the location uh, in the uterus where we put the screw. And, uh, and but it works. It works for, uh, for oncological purposes, for cervical cancer. We also are using it. A screw uh, for the cervical, for oncological purpose, a screw with a small tip, not very deep in order, do not go inside the uterus. So you, Thank you. Usually this screw is five millimeter or 10 millimeter in diameter? Five, five, five. Five, five, millimeter. five, right. five normally, normally a five works well. Mm -hmm. If it is a very big uterus, if the, if the, the uterus is uh, soft uh, with adenomyosis, sometimes you need a, a 10 uh, myoma screw. It, it's true. We have both. We, in, uh, in, uh, in our instrument setting, we have uh, the five and the 10 uh, mm uh, instruments, but most of the times the five mm, uh, it's, uh, it's enough. Partner, May, you have questions? And Professor, although I think you've answered it in the chat, in the question and answer box, it would benefit some, most of our listeners. So maybe we can answer the question regarding uh, what are your choker placements for your TLH? I didn't get the, the question. The question is? What are your choker placements for your lap hysterectomy? Ah, yes, yes, yes. yes. That, is a, that is very important. I, I mentioned a little bit in my talk in one slide. It depends on the size of the uterus. But if it is a regular size, 
I put the optical trocar inside the umbilicus, not uh, around or out of the inside, uh, because the umbilicus is a natural scare and is the thinnest part of the abdominal wall and is the, the safest uh, uh, and uh, cosmetically the best way to go through. And uh, I put uh, three ancillary trocars. Uh, I put uh, one central trocar suprapubic, uh, uh, in a distance uh, between 8 to uh, 10 centimeters uh, uh, below the optical trocar, uh, but not too low because we can go through the, the bladder. And I use the two uh, lateral ancillary trocars uh, on the left and on the right. And those uh, uh, ancillary lateral trocars should be uh, three centimeters away from the anterior superior iliac spine uh, in a line that uh, connects this anterior superior iliac spine uh, and the umbilicus. So three centimeters away from it, following this line on both sides is uh, where I put, because we have to pay attention to the inferior hypogastric arteries that go a little uh, a bit medial to this uh, placement I just said. But we have to be careful because if we make an injury on those uh, vessels, we can have a, a big bleeding uh, uh, in the beginning of our procedure. Uh, and remember that the inferior hypogastric artery is a direct branch of the external iliac artery. So it bleeds. Thank you very much, yeah. Professor. May, may I add to that? Uh... Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. TC. Yes, if you observe these Americans and Europeans usually place their ports medial, the way you do it, professor. But for Asians, they do it ipsilateral. I know. And I ask why, why is that? It's because no, it's, Asians it's... are smaller, they have shorter <laughs> arms. No, no, That's no, why no, they place not... it ipsilateral. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. Uh... It's a school, it's a school. Uh, for example, in the US, it was uh, Charles Go that introduced the, it is related also with the suturing techniques with all the training and courses that uh, we do. The ipsilaterally, uh, from my point of view and according to what I read and according to uh, uh, the, my experience, uh, ipsilateral, I think the learning curve for suturing may be uh, shorter, uh, but this is uh, controversial. We can discuss it in a, another webinar about, but uh, the learning curve is shorter. It probably is a little bit more ergonomic for right-handed people to make it ipsilateral on the right side. But there are also some uh, limitations. Uh, if you are suturing ipsilaterally, or for example, on the right side, and if you have a big uterus and you need to approach on the contralateral side, I mean, for example, in the left side, it can be very challenging and you need to make an extra port on the other side uh, to follow the same technique of ipsilateral. But uh, anyway, uh, both approaches I think are, uh, are, uh, are okay. Uh, as I said, if we have a big uterus, uh, sometimes we need to move upwards the optical trocar uh, and put the trocar in a subchifoid uh, location in order that we have an uh, angle uh, vision uh, offered by the, the, the scope that gives us a, a larger a surgical file to approach the, the larger or the bigger uterus. Uh, but uh, in um, my school in Europe, uh, the clermont ferrand school, is like this and we are happy with this approach. Uh, but uh, I also learned the ipsilateral approach because I did the training in US. Also, I did training in India uh, in uh, with Silas and in other centers. Uh, but I think the central suprapubic uh, uh, approach gives us uh, more versatility to work on uh, both sides of the pelvis and uh, but uh, but it's a matter of training or a matter of school and uh, I also became happy with the ipsilateral. I think at the end I think it boils down to whatever is the surgeon is comfortable with whatever yes, yes ergonomically if you're if you're happy with what you're doing right now. And I think the second thing is the view. There should be a maximal view 
as long as you have a very good view in whatever you're doing, then you can continue. So I hope Dr. Cacho, <clears throat> we were able to answer your question. There's another question here from uh, Dr. Judith Galang Perez. She was asking, what adjustments in exhaust system setup have you made presently to address the theoretical risk of COVID dissemination? Maybe yes, that is a, it's not. Mm -hmm. That is a, a, an important issue at the moment. Uh, we started to use the smoke evacuation filters. Any any uh, smoke that we need to remove, uh, for example, at the end of the procedure to uh, evacuate, we use this, uh, the filters that uh, many companies produce it and uh, it works quite well, theoretically, because uh, 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 there is no proof at the moment that the coronavirus uh, is in the surgical smoke, but anyway, this is a prophylactic measure. Also, uh, to remove the uterus uh, uh, or to remove any specimen from the abdominal cavity before uh, we remove all the gas uh, we, uh, with the suction device or with those filters located in one of the trocars, we remove all the pneumopritonium and only after that we remove the specimens, the uterus or the other specimens from inside the abdominal cavity. Um, and uh, we are happy with the laparoscopic approach because we have much more control on the surgical smoke than in open approach. We did a study in Portugal with the Portuguese Society of Minimal Invasive Surgery, the open approach if you use an electrical bistury, even with a suction system attached, the amount of smoke that is dispersed in the surgical room is much more in comparison with the approach by uh, laparoscopy. Hey, professor, there's another question here. Uh, you mentioned about vaginal dehiscence with uh, total lap hysterectomy. What could be the possible causes for this? Most of the times, the, the, the vaginal dations uh, uh, happens because of a, a not good closure, but there are many other factors involved or risk factors involved that are published, like uh, bad disinfection. There are some uh, uh, infectious agents in the vagina that can, uh, uh, the inflammation can interfere with the, the vaginal calf healing and then can uh, uh, be related with the risk of patients. Also, the comorbidities of the patient, like uh, uh, all the vasculopathies, like diabetes, like uh, heavy smokers, uh, and other uh, vasculopathies, uh, hypertension. Um, but as I said at the beginning, most of the times it happens because we don't close the vagina in a proper way. Generally, I recommend that we should close the vagina in two layers. Uh, one layer closing the mucosa and the other layer um, joining the fascia and the ultrasacral ligaments. Um, the type of suture can be... Uh, can be important. Uh, you should use a good, a good suture. But nowadays in the market, we have a, a very good options. Uh, and also, one of the most common uh, reasons for vaginal castations is the premature intercourse. Uh, we should inform very clearly to our patients. That they just they uh, they just can restart the the sexual intercourse after we check uh, normally can be between five six uh, eight weeks uh, we should uh, in the appointment in the consultation make a good vaginal examination to be sure that the vaginal cuff is uh, is uh, closed and only after that they can start the the normal uh, sexual activity because we have seen the two uh, two cases with the the loops uh, outside the 
the vagina and it's a really scary uh, scenario and if we don't uh, go quick quickly it can be it can be a serious complication for for the patients yeah sometimes we forget that our patients will be engaging in sexual activity after the surgery so thank you very much for that um we have probably time for two or three more questions there's a question here from Thea, what is your opinion on applying an extracorporeal knot on the uterine arteries before coagulation? So probably Dr. Thea is doing a knot. She's she securing her vessels. So what's your opinion? No, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, and uh, honestly, uh, in the beginning and in the, some situations uh, that... Uh, for example, we did not have a good bipolar for the uterine arteries. We used the extracorporeal. And the extracorporeal is a good approach because we control the tension that we apply on the tissues, that we apply on the vascular pedicle, and, uh, and it works quite well. I have the nice videos with the extracorporeal. Uh, the, the important thing of uh, extracorporeal is that... Um, when you are uh, pulling the the thread you should avoid that the thread uh, uh, moves or stretches uh, too much around the the pedicle because you can lacerate the pedicle in uh, in when you are pulling the the thread but uh, they have a nice video of it how we we should do but it's a it's a good approach uh, for uterine vascular pedicle, if we don't have bipolar, or we can do both, but uh, nowadays with this uh, bipolar that I've showed to you, and if we use it in the good way, it works very, very well. But if you you don't have a good bipolar, or if you don't have a bipolar, uh, the extracorporeal shooter is a good approach. I I use it many times, and uh, and I'm happy. Dr. TC, would you like to add something to that? Can't hear you, sir. Microphone, please. Yes, Thank you. No, nothing to add was answered excellently. Thank, Thank you, you, partner. Sir, do you normally do bowel preparations before you do your laparos uh, lapis hysterectomy? Not, not anymore, not anymore. Uh, now, just the low residual the diet uh, three days before the surgery uh, because it helps in the bowel mobilization. It helps in the exposure. If we do the bowel preparation, sometimes the loops can become very distended and, uh, and you lose uh, exposition. But uh, in the beginning, yes, uh, some... Uh, uh, not anymore. Even for endometriosis, we don't do. For endometriosis, sometimes if we know that we are going to perform a resection, a segmental resection, we do a low rectal uh, preparation with a rectal enema or something like that. Thank you very much. Yeah. What's, the, what's, the, what's the standard approach in your country? Do you still perform many open laparotomy? Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, yes. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's changing. Uh, more and more centers are doing uh, laparoscopic hysterectomy, but uh, still uh, many centers doing open. But it's changing uh, rapidly last years last five years uh, you mean you mean you're doing uh, you're doing more laparoscopy yeah 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 and the patient uh, look you're increasing your laparoscopic yeah yeah the, the patients they 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 look for it more and more uh, mm -hmm. because uh, the recover and because all the benefits you can do it in outpatient basis sometimes if you follow the protocol and uh, if you follow also the ERAS program, it's very important, the enhanced recovery after surgery program, it's very important to short the, the, the recover, the after surgery, uh, and, uh, and is, uh, is becoming more and more uh, popular. 
Yes, and but uh, but we still have a, a, that's a, a long that's way in front. Yes, mm -hmm. we need to, to invest more in training, in uh, equipment, uh, in um, in instrument adequate instruments, and all, also uh, uh, what uh, uh, you said is uh, uh, is very important. If we don't have the adequate uh, equipment, adequate devices and instruments. Uh, I recommend everyone uh, do not start or do not try because uh, if you have a complication uh, because you don't have the proper instrumentation, uh, <laughs> no one will uh, will defend you, even the, the, the administration of your hospitals. Yes, patient safety first. Maybe we have last time, last question, one more question. Uh, do you amputate the cervix above the uterus sacral or across the uterus sacral? That is a very good question. Uh, speaking about B9 indications, uh, nowadays, uh, uh, we, after uh, some experience, we uh, cut above the uterosacral uh, origins because if we leave the uterosacral insertions, uh, in terms of uh, dations risk, in terms of uh, uh, vaginal calf prolapse risk, uh, can be better to to leave all the pericervical ring with the uterosacral insertions in place. And it's possible if you open the vagina just above the uterosacral insertions. But at the beginning, uh, and uh, when we started, it was very helpful to cut the uterosacral ligaments because it's the same principle of cutting the posterior leaflet of broad ligament. If you cut both uterosacral ligaments, you gain more mobility of your uterus. You can push it uh, more cephalate and more uh, cranially, and then you theoretically can increase a little bit the safety and the distance between the uterine arteries and the ureter. But this is um, is a feeling, is experience. I'm not sure there are uh, publications uh, speaking about this tip and this small thing, but uh, this is uh, what I want to share with you. But nowadays, we always uh, open above the ultrasacral insertion for benign indications. Uh, but we have uh, more experience. We feel much more comfortable with all the anatomy. But mainly for the starters, uh, can be uh, helpful to to have more mobility and to uh, mobilize uh, more cranially the uterus. But anyway, this is uh, just a, a feeling and just a, a comment. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. So I know that there's still so many questions, but we're running out of time. We have to end this session. By the way, there are two things that you mentioned that I like. The gynecologist is the greatest predator of the ureter. Yes, and what you mentioned about the fat. The fat belongs to the bladder and the fat belongs to the rectum, not to the Alliance Against COVID-19, HPAAC. And uh, we were given this poster to commemorate Christmas at the same time to remind us of what we should be doing. So let me read this to you. Ano man ang uno sa ating buhay, ang sinag ng tala ay nagdadala ng pag-asa. So with that, we will always have to be uh, looking forward to the bright future ahead as we deal with the COVID-19 pandemic that is still ongoing in our country and in the world. So um, next slide. Okay. Do I do? Yes. Yeah. Professor, as you would notice, we are wearing our national costume for you. Yeah, I see. <laughs> I see. I see. Very nice. Very beautiful. <laughs> okay. And Thank we you. love taking pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very nice indeed. Again. Thank you, Professor. Okay. For, uh, thank you. Thank you, baby. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye, Professor. Bye-bye. Stay safe and healthy. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Lawrence, thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you. Claire, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you.